Hey everybody, welcome home. You're watching Legacy Television. I'm Jeremy Pearsons, and as always, we are so glad to have you with us here today in the house of faith. In just a moment, I'm gonna take you into family night. And if you don't know what family night is, that's the opportunity we take around here once a month or so to get together with some of our partners, our friends, our staff, our family, and we just fill up this room and we get together around the word, we get together around singing and praise and worship, and we want you to be a part of that. For so many months now, we have been focusing on the anointing, the anointing that's on Jesus and the anointing that Jesus has, been, uh, has made available to us, and we're gonna continue talking about that today. We're gonna talk about the anointed word, and what is it that makes a word anointed? It's because he said it. So today, get your Bible, get something to make notes with, and come to family night ready to hear something from the anointed word. Watch this. Well, again, we've been talking so much over the last several months about the anointing, and um, unless something changes, I feel like this is probably going to be our last week discussing this specifically. There's some other things the Lord's begun to stir in our hearts that we want to get into as we wrap up the year and get going into the next one. But um, I do want to I do want to add what I think is the final layer for us. This is not certainly not everything there is to say or to know about the anointing. There's so much more, uh, but uh, it has dramatically, like I said a moment ago, impacted my own life to the point now where I'm just unwilling to live life without it, unwilling to preach, unwilling to parent, unwilling to lead, unwilling to do anything in this life without the anointing to do it. And we've covered so much ground over the last several months about the anointing, the burden-removing, yoke-destroying power of God. Folks, that's what we need to be after. As we feed on the Word, as we're in services together, that's what we desire. We can experience a lot of things, but sadly, a lot of things come short and fail to actually remove a burden or destroy a yoke. But that's what I want happening in our times together, in our services as Sarah and I travel and minister in different places across the United States, around the world. This is what we're looking for. We're looking for people to come in contact with the anointing, with that burden removing and yoke destroying power, because that's the state, that's the state mankind was in before Jesus came. That's why he said the Spirit's on me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Mankind as a whole was poor. To heal the brokenhearted, mankind as a whole was brokenhearted. And until Jesus came and until we had contact and an encounter with the anointing, that's the condition we were in. And sadly, that's the condition a lot of people are still in and will remain in unless and until they meet Jesus. Because when they meet Jesus, they'll find out that he was and is still anointed to lift the burden and destroy the yoke in their lives. We've talked so much about the transforming power of the anointing. Remember we talked about Saul. It seems like this keeps coming up month after month. The anointing that came on Saul from Samuel when God anointed him to be the first king of Israel. How it, it literally turned him into another person. And that's what Samuel said. He said, now that you're anointed, uh, the spirit of God's gonna come on you and you will be turned into another man. That's what the anointing does. That's what it did for him. He was a shy insecure individual who came face to face with the call of God on his life and his response was, who am I? Who am I? He called himself the least, the least in the nation of Israel, the smallest of the tribe of Benjamin. He said his family was the smallest of that tribe. I'm small, I'm insignificant. Why are you talking to me like I'm somebody important? Who am I? That's the wrong question. Because when you get stuck asking the question, who am I? Yeah, God, I see what you've called me to. I hear what you're telling me to do, but who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Wrong question. You need to be asking something else. Who are you, Lord, and who am I in you? That's the question you need to be asking and answering. And the anointing of God is present on you to turn you into whatever it is he's called you to be. And that's one of the reasons this has been so significant to me and to Sarah, to our staff and this ministry as we've jumped into this study. is because right now we are before the Lord going, Father, what do you call us? What office do we stand in? What are we anointed to do? I know we've been doing it for a number of years now, but something's coming, something's next. What is it, Lord? What is it? Where are we going? And I finally came to the place where I realized the other day, Jeremy, you can relax because whatever it is and wherever it is, 
You can rest in the Lord knowing that the anointing to do that will turn you into that. Whatever office it is I'm called to stand in, whatever thing it is that you're called and anointed to fulfill in this life, you don't have to freak out about it. You don't have to be scared. You don't have to be nervous. Because the moment you start taking steps towards that, you can rest in knowing that the anointing to be that will turn you into that. Are you with me? That's this power we're talking about. We've talked about how the, the anointing doesn't just turn you into another person, but it's there to strengthen you. Ask Samson. There is no reference in Scripture to his physical strength, to his physical stature. All we know about him is that five times or more in his life, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily on him, and he kicked some Philistine booty I mean, in, a, in a very big way. Well, we get this picture in our heads of some guy that's really you know, really physically fit. I don't care how physically strong you are. You don't kill a thousand guys without the anointing on you. The anointing strengthens. The anointing enables. The anointing transforms. We talked about the anointing that brings joy. You remember that several months ago? That essential oil of joy? That's what the anointing is. It's the oil of joy. And how the 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 power of joy and hope working together, how hope is expectation. And even in the middle of hell on earth, if you are confident in heaven, hope, the expectation of heaven, has the ability to reach into that dimension and bring joy into this one. That's powerful. That's the anointing. We talked a moment ago about the anointing to prosper. Tonight, I want to talk about the anointed word. Go to the book of Romans with me. Chapter 10, the anointed word. Let's read several verses here. Some of these I know you've heard before, but take a look at them again. In Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 11, it says, The scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich. I like that word. The same Lord over all is rich. He's what? Rich. It's a Bible word. He's rich to all who call upon him. In other words, there is enough Jesus to go around. He is rich to all who call on him. And he says here, there's no distinction between Jew, between Greek. There's no distinction in races. There's no distinction in gender. Anybody who will call on Jesus, he will be rich to them. You cannot deplete him of his rich goodness. You can't deplete him of his rich mercy. The Bible says he's rich in mercy. That means there's a lot of it and more where that came from. He's rich to all who call on him. Verse 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then, he's going to ask several questions here. Let's answer them. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? See, believing is simply a response. If you believe something or someone, then what you're saying is, I hear what you're saying and I agree with it or I see what you're saying as the, the evidence that I require for me to put belief in it. Belief is just a response. But what he's saying here is how are they going to call on somebody if they don't even believe he's there? You're not going to call in faith on a God that you don't believe is there. So the question is how can they call on him in whom they haven't believed and the answer is they're not going to. They can't. How will they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Again, believing is just a response. It's a response to what you've heard. And if you haven't heard, then you can't believe. How are they going to believe in him of whom they have not heard? Like this, how shall they hear without a what? Preacher. How are they going to hear without a preacher. And how shall they preach unless they're sent? So what he's doing here is he's starting at the end and backing up. 
the end result that we're looking for that we want is people calling on Jesus. Is that right? Can we come into agreement that that is the objective? That's the objective of ministry. That's the objective as a Christian who's got a witness. Your, you want your life to produce something that so impacts somebody else that they call on the same Jesus that you call on. That's the desired end result, is that somebody calls on him. Now, he's talking about it here, and we use this whole context as salvation. Believe in your heart confess with your mouth, you will be saved. But there's nothing in here that communicates to us that this is a one and done prayer. Yes, it is how you're saved, but the same faith that you're saved by is faith that he expects you to live by. So calling on Jesus for our salvation was not that one thing you did a long time ago. That's that one thing you and I are supposed to be doing every day of our lives, calling on him for that saving grace, that saving power. So the end result is that we want people calling on him. Okay, we'll back it up from there. They're not going to call on him unless they believe. Okay, we'll back it up again. They're not going to believe, what? Unless they've heard. Okay, we'll back it up another step. They're not going to hear unless somebody preaches. And how should they preach, he said, unless they're sent. Now listen to this from verse 17. So then... Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The context of this verse that we as faith people so love. I mean, our faith gun has always got this bullet in it right here. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How does faith come? Comes by hearing. Hearing what? Hearing the word of God. I mean, that's just one we know. But if you've got kids, you've, you've experienced this before, walking through a store with them and they pull something off a shelf that if they break it, you buy it. So what do you say as a parent? Put that back where you found it, right? Well, sometimes I hear the Spirit of God say the same thing to me, especially with these scriptures that we have taken and just they stand on their own and we forget what context they came out of. And I hear the Spirit of the Lord say the same thing to me that I've said to my kids. Jeremy, go put that back where you found it. Put that verse back. You want to you really know what it said? Go put it back where you found it. So put this. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Put that back where you found it. And what he's saying here is that faith does come, but it comes by hearing. And what's he talking about hearing? How can they hear unless somebody preaches? So what he's saying is faith comes by hearing and hearing somebody preach the word of God. One of my favorite things in this entire world is good preaching. Good preaching. I grew up on good preaching. And as a preacher, I have a certain admiration and a love for good preaching. And you know, you've sat under it before. You've listened to preaching that's good and you've listened to other stuff too, right? (laughs) And you know, you know when something hits you, don't you? You know when something you've read a thousand times before, when somebody, check this out, under the anointing, preaches a word that is anointed. And it hits you in a way, and you look up and you think, where has that been? I've seen this, I've read this, but here's what happened. That anointed word touched your heart. And when it touched your heart, it changed your mind. And when it changed your mind, it affected your life and changed the way you live. That's the progression of an anointed word. It first touches the heart, it then renews the mind, which then corrects, directs, instructs the course of your life. So when I say I love good preaching, what I mean is I love preaching that's got the anointing on it. And we've all experienced that. And that's really what the scripture is talking about. Put this up for me, guys, in, that, in the Amplified Bible, if you have that. Romans 10, 17. In the Amplified, I've got it here too as well. I had it. Well, there it is. Okay, Romans 10, 17. Take a look at this. This is the Amplified Bible. So faith comes by hearing... What is told. So there you go. There again, you see it, the preaching of it, right? 
That's what this is a reference to. Faith comes by hearing what is told, and what is heard comes by the what? The preaching. The preaching. Now, you guys going to help me preach this tonight? I love it when people will actually get involved with you and help you preach it. That's one of those things people say. An excited group of people. Some people shout amen. Some people say that's good. You want to know all the ones I like? Preach. <laughs> preach it, preacher. Preach. So if anything at any point tonight, you know, strikes your fancy, <laughs> just get it out a good preach. Preach that. Say that. Preach it. Because this is what we're talking about tonight. Anointed preaching. Faith comes by hearing what is told and what is heard comes by the preaching, but not just any preaching. Preaching of the message, watch this, preaching of the message that came from the lips of Christ. Help me out. What's Christ? What does that mean? We've talked about it. The anointed. The anointed one. His anointing. We're talking about the preaching, the message that came from the lips. Out of the mouth of Jesus. How many of you would agree that the anointed one preached an anointed word? I don't think we really can fathom what it would have been like to sit there under that preaching because Jesus preached and to the thousands he preached to, not one of them were born again. Not a single one of them were filled with the Holy Ghost. But imagine you and I now, born again and full of the same spirit that's preaching. Can you imagine what that environment and that atmosphere would have been like? Put that up there again. I want you to see this. How does faith come? It comes by hearing what is told. What is heard comes by the preaching, but specifically the preaching of the message that came from the lips of Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah himself. I love anointed preaching. You know, we live right now, I think, in a culture that's more, uh, we've got more, what are they called, dietary restrictions now, I think, than ever before. New ones exist that I think have never existed before. I heard one comedian, Christian guy, one time talk about, he said, you know, it's crazy all the dietary restrictions we have here because when I go on the mission field and I'm handing out peanut butter sandwiches to little kids in Africa, not one of them say, I have a peanut allergy. Not one of them, you know, and I'm not knocking that. I realize people have it for sure. But what, are a, what is a dietary restriction? It's something that you either stay away from or something that you eat just based on how it affects you, based on how your body processes it, based on how you feel after you have it. And a lot of people have varying degrees of dietary restrictions. Well, let me tell you something. When it comes to what you feed on spiritually, you and I ought to have some pretty major and very strict dietary restrictions. In other words, thank you, sir. In other words, you ought not just feed on every old thing. And there are people with such physical dietary restrictions, a lot of it is because they can't eat what food has become. Right? There are foods now on the shelves of our grocery stores that didn't exist 100 years ago. Why? Because nobody had the technology to scientifically and genetically modify something to the point where it tastes good, but it's not food. And now our grocery stores are full of that stuff. Genetically modified food, genetically engineered. It's not food. And there are a lot of people and their bodies can't process it. Their bodies can't handle it. Maybe they think they can, but it's causing all sorts of stuff. It tastes good and that's why they like it. But you and I have no business feeding on a genetically modified gospel. We have no business feeding on something that isn't pure, that isn't true, that isn't right, that isn't real. How does faith come? Well, it comes by hearing, hearing by the word. Put it back where you found it. It comes, it comes through anointed preaching 
But the word you're supposed to be feeding on has got to be rich in faith content. It's got to be nutrient rich in the love of God, in the grace of God. But more important than anything else, the word you feed on, your spiritual diet has got to be a word that preaches Jesus more than anything. What is a word that preaches Jesus? Well, you see here, it's the message that came from his lips. It's what he preached. But it's not just what he preached. It's any message that points back to him. It's any message that magnifies him. It's anything that exalts him. That's an anointed word. And that's a word that will bring faith. That's a word that stirs faith. Somebody say preach. Go to the book of Luke, chapter 4. Wouldn't it stand to reason that if a word can be anointed, then you can have a word that's not? We're going to see this in a moment, but the, everything we've talked about, the anointing and what it has the ability to do, an anointed word is what has the ability to do that. Well, let's just look at it. Let's see it in the life of Jesus. Luke chapter 4, this has been our text this entire series. But I want to back up tonight to verse 16. And it says, So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. That's an important detail for what we're about to see. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. In other words, he knows these people and they know him. And not only do they know him now, but they knew him back when. And there's a bunch of people in this town that probably still see him as that kid, that teenager, that young person. He came back to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Verse 20 says, He closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on Him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, I want you to notice the response of the people. We've talked a lot about what he said here, but we really haven't gotten into their response to it. Because he stands up and reads. This is just scripture. This isn't something Jesus is uh, making up on the spot. This isn't Jesus preaching or expounding on something. He's just reading scripture. And it's probably scripture that these people were already familiar with because they know that this is the prophet Isaiah speaking prophetically as the Christ, the anointed one. And so all Jesus is doing is reading scripture. That's it. Do you see that? Can we agree on that? That's all he did was stand up and read something they'd probably heard before. But notice what happened. He said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Verse 22 so all bore witness to him and marveled. What did they marvel at? At the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Check this out. This is the Passion Translation. Everyone was impressed. That's what that word marvel means. It means they admired him. They were all impressed by how well Jesus spoke. Hmm. They were in awe of the beautiful words of grace that came from his lips. Now, what did we just read in Romans chapter 10? Faith comes by hearing what is told. And what is heard, it comes from the preaching of the message that comes from the lips of Christ, the anointed.
like a statue that stood through the ages more than history sealed on the pages throughout time and all generations his mercy I pray that the first few days of this new year have been some of the most prosperous that you've ever experienced before. And I pray that you sense the grace of God carrying you right now with momentum into this great year that's right here in front of us. You know, right now at the beginning of a new year is an awesome time to make some changes and to rededicate yourself to the Word of God and putting His Word first place. And that's why I want to make this brand new book available that Sarah and I have written together. It's a 52-week devotional that we've called From Glory to glory. And there's a devotional in here for every week of the year for you to meditate on and feed on it and let it set some course for you for that week and for that month. And when you put the Word of God first place in your life, you honor Him and His Word, He will honor you. And these, these devotionals are about everything from healing uh, to your walk and fellowship and relationship with the Lord and other people about your prosperity. And we called it From Glory to Glory because that's the way we believe God intended for us to be living life is this unending crescendo of increase from one manifestation of the glory of God to another, to another, to another. So if you want to get this book, all the ordering information and pricing information is online at pearsonsministries.com. Get this today. Thanks so much for watching today. As always, if you want to partner with us and what God is doing in this ministry, we welcome it and we call you blessed. There's ways right now in front of you on your screen that you can give and be a part of what God is doing here at Pearson's Ministries International and through Legacy Studios. And together as partners, we are preaching Jesus to everyone, everywhere, every day. And we're serving another generation with the Word of God. And we thank you for being a part of that with us. Thanks so much for watching today. We look forward to seeing you again next time on Legacy TV. Bye-bye.